what do you think is the future of data pipelines and how is TyPy addressing these kinds of pain points that organizations are experiencing with their data pipelines? My feeling is that it's still a not so mature area. That's why we wanted to start with a good graphical tools. I mean, there's nothing like graphics to share across a team of development. This is really uh, the big challenge for AI in general, is how to, do you make end users use these algorithms? And this is why we have created TypePack. Vincent, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's great to have you here. Where in the world are you calling in from? Thanks, John, for having me. I'm coming from uh, a place called uh, Plateau de Saclay, which is just south of Paris. So that's in France. Nice. So you are the CEO and co-founder of TyPy, which is an open source Python platform. It's a data-driven web application builder. Can you elaborate for us on what TyPy does? Okay, so let me give you a bit of perspective. Um, I've worked for many years um, building applications in the AI uh, world for large companies. We have done that for uh, companies like the container terminals in Singapore, um, companies in the semiconductor business like Samsung, TSMC, and McDonald's, and, and so on and so forth. Disney for manpower planning and, and so, so large companies. Um, we have done that for a long time in, in Java, Scala, um, earlier on in C++. And these were heavy projects. And, you know, we, we really wanted to do that in Python. Uh, everything. I mean, from all, all the different functions, front-end, back-end. And since we loved Python, uh, we said, well, let's do that. And we rea realized there were some issues. Uh, one on the back end first uh, for the kind of application we had in mind, which are mostly you know, AI application with end users, right? end users using the software, uh, smart or not so smart software, but they, they, there is a graphical interface, which is very important here. So the, on the graphical side, we were not happy with what uh, Python was proposing uh, in its ecosystem in, in those days, a few years back. Uh, we looked at several software uh, and we couldn't find what we needed in terms of having a powerful uh, graphical interface builder where you can really design easily, um, you know, graphics, charts, and pages, a lot of interactions, uh, having it multi-user, uh, and so on. And easy to use. That's the important thing. We wanted any Python developer uh, to be able to develop uh, graphical interfaces. The second component was on the back end. As you know, software are not only about user interfaces, it's also about the back end. And we looked around and there were tools in the Python ecosystem also, but we found them uh, either extremely complex or for what we wanted, we would need like three or four of these packages. So we decided to build really TypePy around these two uh, package, two packages, TypePy GUI and TypePy Core. That's how it started. Um, um, this is the, the, the origin of the, of the product. Right, so the, the, these two, can we call them two separate products, GUI and Core? So initially, uh, they have been designed um, as two separate packages. So when you do a pip install TypePy, for instance, you do get uh, both uh, package if you want, and you can use one or the other. There is no uh, connections, if you want, between them. But this is not uh, what will happen soon. Uh, in the next release, we are going to link the two. For instance, our so the graphical components are basically built on top of Plotly, and the, this is really an augmented markdown. Uh, capability that we provide to really build quickly these interfaces. On, on the back end, we do provide pipelines. Uh, we have a great pipeline uh, editor. We're the only tool to provide this functionality of quickly building graphically your pipeline, not only with styles, but also data. No, the data is modeled on all the flows and, and so on. And we have this concept, a very important concept called scenarios. Scenarios are really about 
being able to run your pipelines with different parameters and to keep these runs, these executions, and be able to compare them. Uh, you can compare two scenarios. Uh, you can compare them over time. Um, but in the next release, uh, what we want is these two components to come together. So you will be able to graphically see uh, all the, the, the scenarios, for instance, that have occurred in the past two weeks and select them and visualize the data node uh, automatically. And all of this is like a, a single graphical component that visualize your backend uh, component. So this is where we are going, and that will be available in, in June for our next release. Nice. That sounds really exciting. So um, so I understand the, the GUI uh, component. It seems very easy for me to understand. The type I GUI component, it's difficult or it historically was difficult to build uh, graphical interfaces easily in Python. And so TyPy GUI offers this solution. For TyPy Core, um, could you elaborate for me a bit more on what the problem was and how TyPy Core is a solution? Like, uh, so you were talking about having to use three or four different applications previously to achieve the same objective, but maybe like uh, giving us a specific use case of uh, w the way that things were before Type I Core and now uh, how that same um, endpoint can be reached much more easily with Type I Core. Sure. So the first thing is Type I is all about pipelines and building pipelines. Um, and our objective is not only to cater for the needs of people who are already building pipelines, but we want also to bring people who are not using pipelines to use pipelines. Uh, pipeline is a, also a kind of methodology to build your algorithms. We are still seeing a lot of Python developers uh, you know, involved with some kind of spaghetti programming, and, uh, which are, should be solved with, uh, with pipelines. For instance, in pipelines, in, in type by core, you can, for instance, uh, do caching. So if one of your tasks have already have not changed or the input have not changed, there's no reason to run it again. So pipelines bring a lot of facility for, for, for doing that. Um, the other aspect uh, that you have uh, is also to make sure uh, this corresponds to, to best practices. Uh, it, when you build your pipelines. Uh, for instance, in machine learning, you, you really have to build uh, your main algorithm, but you, you need to have uh, you know, what is called, uh, uh, I forgot the name, it's like having the canary, canary in the mind, you know, where, where you can have a second or third algorithms to compare with. So th there are a few things uh, relating to this. So first, again, it's all about the ease to build uh, these pipelines. We don't want people to be struggling to build a simple or complex pipelines. Hence this graphical editor, which is an extension of visual code and allows anybody really to build uh, pipelines where you have predefined data nodes uh, that can read external data. A uh, data node can be even your own parameter, a Python object that uh, gets modified through the graphical interface, for instance. And you produce output data node. Uh, the task will do that. And this data node, this output data node, will have to be stored and kept and so on. And the thing that we couldn't find are really the concept of scenario. A scenario is really, in, in the world of machine learning, uh, they refer to experiment, I suppose. But we want to go way beyond just the, the, the realm of data science here. We want to look at the complete application. So in that sense, uh, you know, most of these algorithms will end up in the hands of end users where you have graphics and, you ha and they will be using your pipelines and they will be modifying these pipelines. How? By parameters. Um, we have an example, for instance, for Intermarché, one of the largest retailers in Europe. Uh, when you deal with projections for the stores uh, or the cash flow for the whole company, uh, the COVID data is actually something that no one had had any data. So it was really data that only the end user could inject in the pipelines to really look at different kinds of scenarios. 
So this capability to build scenario is something really unique. We couldn't find this anywhere in any of the exi existing tools. Uh, so and that's the heart of, of Type by Core. Um, and if you look at the, the other software, so of course there are software uh, packages like uh, Airflow, for instance. So Airflow is, is really covering some of what we are doing, but it's quite complicated. There is a big learning curve involved. Um, there are some other tools like um, uh, tools like, uh, for instance, uh, Prefect, for instance, which is a, a, a nice software. But it's like it's lacking also this great editor. There's no concept free of scenarios and, and this kind of thing. So again, it's it's all about uh, having the capability to build easily uh, these uh, these pipelines to track every single run. Uh, to be able to consider things like business cycles. So that's from our background. We come from a big, we work with big companies. So when you work for McDonald's, for instance, and you do a forecast for each of their stores, every week they need to produce a forecast. So it's kind of weekly cycle. Uh, for another situation, it could be a monthly set cycle or daily cycle. So all your scenarios you run needs to be sorted per uh, bucket, time bucket, a week, a day, a month, whatever. So all of this is kind of pre-built. Uh, and again, really easy to use uh, to come up with your, your backend. Are you moving from batch to real-time? Pathway makes real-time machine learning and data processing simple. Run your pipeline in Python or SQL in the same manner as you would for batch processing. With Pathway, it will work as is in streaming mode. Pathway will handle all of the data updates for you automatically. The free and source available solution based on a powerful Rust engine ensures consistency at all times. Pathway makes it simple to enrich your data, create and process machine learning features, and draw conclusions quickly. All developers can access the enterprise proven technology for free at pathway.com. Check it out. Nice, okay, so to try to summarize back for you, uh, what I now think I understand really well about this product, uh, about this component of TypeBy. So the core component allows you to build pipelines easily. So even people who haven't felt like they could do pipelining before, they can uh, now understand this great way of organizing your project so that you don't have, as you described it, spaghetti code uh, linking everything together. So you can have clearly defined nodes, uh, clearly defined data flows uh, into and out of your analytics processes, your machine learning models, maybe some combination of those things, because you could have some data inflowing then some pre-processing steps, then maybe it goes through a machine learning model and then flows into some analytics so that uh, a report can be created, say on a daily cadence or a weekly cadence. And that whole flow can be captured as a well-organized scenario. Absolutely. And uh, for us, we consider that we have two kinds of uh, users, so the data scientist can also program, of course, this, all this, but he's also a user. And he can he can also build a graphical interface for his own pipeline and use that. A click but, and point user. Exactly. And, and you have, of course, the, the end user, the, the person who doesn't know how to program in Python will be using this, but he also uh, needs to run these scenarios uh, to, to, to do some variation, to start a forecast uh, with different values, for instance, the the parameter for the forecast could be the date from which you want to start the forecast. Um, you may try to want different values. So all of these are also scenarios. Right, right, right. So the so you could potentially have uh, a Python developer, a data scientist who is programming up a type I core scenario, and then an end user at a specific McDonald's location could take that scenario and rerun it on a different day of the week or with some different kind of input parameter. Exactly, and thus creating more scenarios. And usually at the end of the day, he will pick one of these scenario as an end user and say, you know, right. that's the scenario that I want to be published, to be official. Right, 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 right. Cool, all right, now I understand. That sounds great. Um, and then coming up in June, and I think we'll talk about this more later in the episode, these two, different key components of the TyPy uh, software library, the, this open source library TyPy. So we 
historically had the GUI part and the core part being separate, but coming up soon, those will be blended together. Um, and so, for example, you'll be able to do things like being able to visualize um, in the GUI component the uh, the way that your data flows are set up within core. Yeah, so basically, data flows are quite simple. You model the data. This is model less data nodes um, and tasks. That, 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 and that makes your pipelines, or yeah, you can have several pipelines uh, modeled. Um, so, and, and this will be run. Each run will happen with different values of your parameters, and this is what we call scenarios. So basically, it's four concepts. Data nodes, tasks, uh, pipelines, and scenarios. All of this can be visualized. So if I select a scenario, I want to know, uh, you know what are the data nodes, what data is inside each data node. So you can have really like, a, you know, graphically, you can have a selector of scenarios. So automatically, you have all your scenarios appearing. Um, you can select one, and it will show up, you know, what are the data nodes. Uh, with the, and you can click on one of these data nodes and have a view as a table, as a chart, or charts of that data. So all of this will be kind of uh, ready to use within the graphical uh, type by graphical objects, where you can not only visualize your own stuff, but also the backend uh, itself. So that will make the programming and the development of the full application even faster. Uh, so nice. you, you bring basically the two elements together. And to dig into those, so we've talked about scenarios a fair bit now, to dig into the data nodes and the tasks a little bit more, am I, I'm kind of getting the impression, and you can correct me on what I'm getting right, what I'm getting wrong about these, but maybe the data nodes, uh, these are like the data structures. So it's like, it could be a table of data, um, whereas the tasks, these do work. These are more like the verbs. So like the data nodes are like the nouns <laughs> um, and the tasks are like the verbs doing work on those nouns. Yes, exactly. And to, to be even more concrete, uh, data nodes, they are predefined data nodes, uh, a CSV data node, a JSON data node, a Parquet data node, uh, and so on. Um, a data node may not only be a pointer to some external data, it could be also a Python object, uh, like uh, you know, a date that is entered through your graphical interface. That's also a data node. Right. And you have the, outs, the, the output data nodes, uh, which are created by your tasks. So the task take as input the input data node and as output right. the output data node and the data node the output data node will actually store the data uh, for if uh, in inside each scenario. So these are data generated uh, and kept by TypePy TypePy Core, and the task is purely a, a Python function. Right. So it fits very well within your IDE, uh, whatever IDE you. you you're using. One thing I want to say also is that we made also a big point to make sure that TypePy was working, uh, not only uh, as a .py or IDE uh, environment, but also within notebooks. Nice. So we are the, one of the, I think we are the only, for instance, interface, a full, full, you know, web, web application graphics that you can trigger from a notebook. That's great to hear because that is often a nightmare. Like I've tried lots of different kinds of visualizations, particularly if you're trying to get a visualization outside of the specific browser tab that you're in, in exactly. a Jupyter Notebook, exactly. it can be an absolute nightmare. So that's great to hear. Yeah, that, that was, I had to convince the, our R&D team that on, on day one, we had a fairly strong argument on this and I won. I'm <laughs> happy to, to have won. Nice. I'm glad you won as well, Vincent. <laughs> nice. Um, so... Let's dig a bit more into the data pipelines aspect. This is something in a lot of recent episodes of the show, we've talked about data pipelines. This is something that it seems like a lot of organizations are thinking about this in a new way. So things like having your data pipelines be scalable, be reusable, be flexible, be maintainable. Um, this, is a, this is a challenge that a lot of organizations are confronting. So, um, what do you think is the future of data pipelines and how is TypePy addressing these kinds of pain points that organizations are experiencing with their data pipelines? 
Very good question. My feeling is that it's still a not so mature area. Um, that's why we wanted to start with a good graphical tools. I mean, there's nothing like graphics to share across a team of development. Um, so that's partic that participates to the, I feel, to the best practices um, so that you, you first design graphically your, your, and quickly your, uh, your pipelines. You can share that with the team. Um, of course, there are situations where you, you, you may need to use a program to build your pipeline because there are situations where your pipeline is dynamic. You don't know in advance what the pipeline will look like. So we have this option still. But most of the time, your pipeline basically uh, can be drawn uh, on, on a graphical editor. So that, that's very important. Um, some of the features that, that we'll be looking at are, of course, to improve. Um, um, of course, with TAPA, you execute those pipelines. You have this concept of scenario, which we thought was, was very important to bring uh, to the table. In terms of the uh, the roadmap, there are important things that uh, will, will be coming uh, soon. One is to stop having DAGs. You remember all these pipelines are supposed to be DAGs. Uh, yeah, actually, this whole time that you've been talking about this, I've been imagining that this is a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. Exactly. So, so, now we so have these to aren't. Find, no. Well, at, the, at this stage, they still are, but I want to get rid of this. We need to get rid of that. for. Simply, we need to have if nodes appear in a DAG where you can go back. That's very useful when you want to model drift, uh, especially graphically. I want to see this node where you can write rules to be able to detect, um, for instance, uh, the reason for, for uh, retraining. So we are going to have to go back. Of course, the cycle cannot be uh, basically looping. <laughs> So there will be some limits to that, but we will be provide this in in, a, in future release. Um, we would like also to. There are a few books that have been addressing this, but to come up with templates, pipeline templates, they are good practices. I still talk to students or even people who are starting in the career of um, data scientists, and they really forget, uh, you know, what are the best practices for. Uh, doing their algorithm. So here I'm talking about specifically about machine learning, uh, how you do the testing, all these things. So this will help a lot if you had template uh, available. So we plan to have a way to, to store pipeline templates, a little bit like hugging face, but on the template side, not on the model side. There is a big, big opportunity here, we feel. And of course, the company itself to build its own pipeline to be reused uh, by, by other developers. And, Newcomers, um, and, and there is a lot of work to be to be done on that uh, on that field. Yeah, and I think something that ties into that that you guys really excel at at TypeI is data pipeline versioning. Absolutely. So this is something also. So here we are not talking about uh, code versioning. Uh, we are not even talking about uh, you know the versioning, a la MLOps. So where you have, uh, you, we have registries, different versions for your machine learning. You could do that, but I think MLOps is really the best tool for, for doing that. We're talking about the pipeline itself. When you build a pipeline, and the pipeline goes way beyond the pipeline of just doing, uh, you know, the training and, and the, the, the testing. It's also, there's a pipeline after scoring that you need to, to model. Uh, when you start um, doing this, um, it's kind of uh, your pipeline is doomed to evolve. You may discover that you have a great external data source that will benefit your model. Um, again, I'm, con I'm con talking about the context of machine learning, but it works in other contexts where you don't necessarily do machine learning, where you have a new data source, where you have a new task uh, that you want to add, and your previous run that you have kept for the past 12 months don't work anymore. So you need to version your pipeline and to have also the tools to be able to migrate your previous run so that they still work with the new version of your pipeline. So that's something which is also fairly un unique and that we bring to, to the table here for, with TypeBycore.
Nice. And that must be great, not only for uh, when an individual makes adaptations to a pipeline, um, but also, of course, you made that point of across the organization, a newcomer comes in, they can see, okay, this is how things are today. I can see it clearly graphically. And you can see this history of how it evolved to where it is today. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you need absolutely to be able to do simple comparison between versions that will tell you, oh, you can't use that because this new data node has been added on that date. On this uh, algorithm, it has a completely different version number um, or is new, brand new. So yeah, you, you need to track that and you need to have different behaviors, whether you are in a production mode or just in staging mode or just development mode. Every company wants to become more data-driven, especially with languages like R and Python. Unfortunately, traditional data science training is broken. The material is generic. You're learning in isolation. You never end up applying anything you've learned. Posit Academy fixes this with collaborative expert-led training that's actually relant to your job. Do you work in finance? Learn R and Python within the context of investment analysis. Are you a biostatistician? Then learn while working through clinical analysis projects. Posit Academy is the ultimate learning experience for professional teams in any industry that want to learn R and Python for data science. 94% of learners are still coding six months later. Learn more at posit.co slash academy. So you work with a lot of different companies. Some of them are small, some of them are big. They're in lots of different verticals. Are there any kinds of trends or generalizations you can make with respect to the kinds of companies that... Um, are successful at adopting these pipelines or um, are, there, are there just, I guess, are there differences in general between how these different kinds of companies, big, small, different verticals, deal with data pipelines? Yes, yeah, so here, I would give you a bit of a historical background also here. So I want to say that this data thing is, if you look back 30 years ago, uh, has changed a lot. Before. Data was not the center stage. It was about you know doing an algorithm. So when we're dealing with a I don't know, the port of Singapore, you had to find the best algorithm to uh, load as quickly as possible the containers loading on discharge of containers on a container vessel. Um, so that was the objective. And, but very often at the start of the project, you realize that data wasn't there, wasn't of high quality, and you started to get into trouble. So this has changed, luckily. And people are much more aware, especially organizations these days, large organizations have done a huge effort to make data center stage. Um, and now the question is almost the opposite. I've got all this data, what can I do with it? <laughs> so of course, this is where you come in and, and, and you, you help uh, create this problem so, uh, or solve these problems. So what you see is that uh, there are big differences between companies. Uh, if you talk to companies in the semiconductor business with everything is automated, you know, in the plants um, or in companies like Samsung, TSMC, McDonald's, the data quality is extremely high, um, which, of course, creates a, a fantastic environment for you to, to be successful with your project. The, the main issue that, that we are seeing right now is not so much on the data uh, side. It's the fact that Python is fast becoming uh, the mainstream language. So it used to be a glue language that did move into the AI language, the main language for AI, into mainstream. Uh, to a point where even CIOs who didn't want to do to have anything to do with Python now they they have to. Uh, so, but that creates a need to have tools uh, really to scale up to be able not only to be used for pilots but also into full applications. So the danger here is, and that we have seen, basically Gartner was also had a report on this where he had 85% of pilots in Python staying pilots, not making it to the next stage for various reasons. Uh, uh, lack of skills, because a lot of things were not reused. They were starting again from scratch after the pilot. So you have to have a JavaScript guy, you have to have a another data guy, DevOps guy, and so on and so forth. So this is not sustainable. Um, and this is why also we have created Type by to really ease that process, not to to stop with silos. You know, the, the innovation group doing some pilots on the IT group uh, doing the uh, 
a redevelopment from scratch. That's really crazy. Uh, to be able to have somebody who is uh, good in who knows Python to be able to you to develop an application very quickly without having like eight or nine or ten people around him, uh, which increases the cost also. Where you move from a pilot for twenty k to a full application for half a million or more. Um, there is also the, the the silo issue is always an issue uh, everywhere. Uh, uh, I hear very often, you know, the data scientist group saying, okay, I'm, I'm exposing my algorithm. My algorithm is exposed. And that's it, as if life has stopped. <laughs> that's not how it works. The, the algorithm will end up inside a full application. And this is where you need to continue the pipeline thing towards the execution side. Uh, you need to be able for the data scientist to understand what the end user will be doing with uh, his pipelines. So we see the pipeline really getting beyond the data science uh, and cover the whole application. Okay, so in addition to having these data pipelines be uh, accessible outside of just silos, it's nice for data pipelines and code in general to be accessible beyond just people who are um, very serious developers. Um, so there's advantages um, in terms of being able to share what you're doing, being able to easily collaborate on what you're doing to having low code um, versions or uh, you know uh, low code implementations, um, and you recently said in an interview with a French news network that you uh, you know you, you're having more and more of these kinds of low code um, uh, functionalities within TyPy, and this seems to be a popular trend. Some people talk about it as like a democratization of uh, of machine learning or of data science. Uh, so, um, yeah, what do you think about this general trend? And how do you think that they're impacting the whole data science lifecycle? Great question. So on that aspect, uh, we see that, uh, first of all, I want to say that we are low code, not no code. So coding is still center stage with type by. I mean, I, we, it's very important there's a level of customization and tool has been designed uh, really to allow for really fairly uh, important customization i don't believe uh, you know we are not in the field of of complete auto generation of, of code here at all we need python developers typepy is for python developers but you know we want their work to be much much more efficient and also much more successful. We want Python, you know, to, uh, I was saying, to go all the way from pilot to applications. We want Python to go beyond just the, the, in the building of pipelines uh, for AI or other types of algorithms. Or um, We will go, nevertheless, in terms of roadmap towards a bit more automation, uh, even more. Uh, for instance, I was talking about, you know, these components uh, that will bring both graphics and backend objects. For instance, if you want to see a data node, so you would, you know, you have the data node graphical object, which will immediately show you uh, if it's a table, the table view, you'll be able to scroll to see that, or maybe some charts automatically uh, for you to do that. We are thinking of having post natural language interface, like, like where you can query your table or your uh, and, and generate automatically type by graphical objects. Uh, so this would be would be good. So that's the level of automation that brings a lot of value to the data scientist and to the end user. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing. But we will always at this stage. I'm not seeing any move towards going into no code. And even our low code is still requires coding because we we want the product to be open and be highly customizable. Nice. So then, so this is like a, so what does it mean? So it's very easy for me to understand in my head um, the idea of no code. Okay. It's like, so some people are out there trying to build a no code application where you just click and point, you drag. So like a very good, a, a well-known publicly listed version of this kind of tool is Alteryx, yes. where the idea is that you can build these visual pipelines and everything is, there's no code at all. Just everything's click and point. So what does it mean for something to be low code? <laughs> What's high code <laughs> in contrast? 
but it, it's true. The, the word local is undefined almost. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen low code that are very close to no code for me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and low code where you still have to do quite a bit of programming, which is the case for, for, for TypePy. The, the, the reason is that if you look at the graphical interface, we don't want to be to have our hands tied as, as a developer. You know, if I look at some no-code application in terms of graphics, for instance, there are things I will not be able to do. I may want not only to visualize stuff, but I want to click on a particular cell in the table and I want a particular graphics to pop up and I want to update maybe two or three pages uh, that that uh, can be impacted by, 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 by that thing. So you need a very rich capability to deal with, uh, you know, kind of to provide a, a lot of freedom. So the freedom, which is about customization, is very important. You don't have that. The more you go towards the no-code field, the, the more uh, the more your hands are tied, yeah. basically. So that's why we're not competing with tools like uh, Gradio, for instance, which is a kind of things we, we, we are not, we are much more into the coding here, but uh, we want to get rid of, we want to automate this to a level where, you know, you can build very quickly an interface. Uh, we, I can give you some examples, for instance, of some yeah. customers where they developed, so this was not no code, they developed, for instance, in, in Python or in Java with nothing, really from scratch, an application, which was a machine learning application, using some standard tools for machine learning and even for the pipeline stuff. Um, it took them like seven, eight months, five, four to five people to do it with the graphics, the backend, everything. Um, the same, the very same thing was developed in a month and a half with one person, two person, one and a half person. So you basically divide the, the, the time by three or four, the number of people by two, and you get a factor 10 cost wise. Uh, so that that's what we want, but we don't want to compromise on the customization level uh, as little as possible, because we are developers. We 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 know that uh, we don't want to provide, for instance, the graphical stuff. We have no interest to look at tools like we are not a BI tool, for instance, where where you do everything, uh, because we don't want to read only st stuff. We have seen what these tools can do. They have their own market, uh, but we want much more flexibility. Um, and we don't want to, 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 to do that. So that, that was a choice at the start. So I'm not seeing uh, a reason for us to change this, um, especially now uh, we are seeing a lot of CIOs moving into Python. Mm -hmm. And the C type I has really a, a fantastic stepping stone for them to get into that world. It lowers the learning curve and so on, but they have serious application to build. When you build the kind of application for, for different companies I mentioned, which are usually large retailers or logistics or manufacturers, these are fairly heavy duty thing, graphic, graphic wise, backend wise. Um, most of the, if you were to do a, a fairly a no code, yeah, you, you won't go very far. And again, our focus is really to have end users uh, behind and people who will be using your algorithms, your pipeline on a day to day or once a month, depending on the situation. But th these people are demanding. <laughs> <laughs> they always want parameters, changes, great graphics. Yeah. And so on. Nice. So I get it. So low code means efficiency and automation wherever possible. It means a shallower learning curve while still allowing for a huge amount of flexibility to suit, you know, whatever Ab kind of absolutely and graphics absolutely. And response, for example. Okay, cool. Uh, so this leads me to another question, which is, so you've talked a lot from the beginning of this episode, you can, you can tell the way that you think about uh, building the type I application, the way that you think about solving problems, you're always thinking long term, you're you know, from your very first answer, you were like, let me start at the beginning and why we needed to do it this way. So when you were building TyPy right from the outset uh, through to today, what were the kinds of decisions that you made around um, 
the languages that you would use. Like this, this type by application, it's um, it's quite complex in the sense that it is it covers like the whole stack. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, you have you have to have very efficient backend operations, but you also have to have great visuals. So, what are the kinds of decisions that you made as you began developing Type I? How did you choose the the programming languages, for example, that underpin it? Well, first of all, we're a bit of a strange startup. Is that we we have contacts in a large corporate organizations, so the software was built based on our experience um, with large companies. So that was kind of uh, right from day one, it was about building you know, full-blown applications, not, not pilots only. Of course, we can use it for pilots, but not only for pilots. So that was one of the things. So we, we clearly set up you know, what were the, the objectives of, the, uh, of, of TypePy. Uh, we explained that to, to the R&D team. Uh, after that, uh, of course, they make their own choices. So of course, on the graphical side, um, everything was built on JavaScript. It's built on top of Plotly. So some of the choices you have to make as an r and is which library are you going to build upon to, 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 to build your software? So we made choices to, on, on Plotly, but we also want to open the product with an API to, to basically connect with any other uh, graphical libraries. Um, we worked with uh, different uh, on the back end. Uh, we have decided, for instance, how how can we build a graphical editor? Well, the choice was after looking around. Well, let's do it with Visual Code extensions, and that worked out really well. Uh, so you always have to be on the lookout for what are the libraries in Python that can really help you make your software more powerful, more complete, still keeping the philosophy, which is to be sufficiently customizable and easy to learn. So that, that's really the, the thing that we become. Otherwise, the, the R&D team itself, yeah, they, they, they use things like uh, Git Copilot for their own programming things and some, some other stuff, I'm sure. I'm not completely aware of what tools <laughs> Use internally. Nice. Well, I'm sure it's great for our audience to hear uh, the kinds of decisions that you're making when you're designing a platform like this, and uh, to be able to hear about it uh, from conception like that. Um, going back even further into your history, pre Taipei Vincent, you've held several analytics leadership positions for consulting firms like a VP of Advanced Analytics for Decision Brain. Uh, you were director of Advanced Analytics for IBM. And so you were working on problems across a broad range of industries, apparel, container terminals, semiconductors, fast food, airspace, finance. Um, so you've alluded to some of these things already in this episode, like shipping containers in Singapore, McDonald's, um, Intermarché. Um, but how, are, if there are some kind of insights that you can provide to our audience from having worked across all of these different verticals with so many different kinds of companies, um, are there any trends that you see out there in terms of how um, companies manage their data or um, set up machine learning applications with, you know, to learn from their data? Um, I'd love to hear about uh, your thoughts on this. And, and then something that kind of ties into this personally <laughs> is, do you think that this kind of, um, this kind of experience that you have, having worked for so many different kinds of companies across so many different kinds of industries, do you think that this kind of approach gives people an advantage when they then later come to build a general solution like TyPy? Okay, so a wide topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so definitely uh, over the years, uh, we have seen, a, as I mentioned earlier, also big differences in uh, in application and we, we 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 you definitely need to build over the years best, pra best practices to s educate your customers um, um, for them to be successful uh, they spend a lot of money on, on some of these systems uh, 
and the ROI can be very large. That's why people talk about AI is all about ROI very often. Um, so, yeah, so what I want to say is that um, there are a few things. So we see some areas of excellence. So for instance, you may have in a company really a group that does extremely extraordinary stuff uh, with AI application or some data. The challenge that we see is how to spread this to the operations, to the different uh, functions within the company, whether at the finance level, like in Intermarché, where they really looked at optimizing and predicting cash flow for the whole company, to just people, planners in, in the port of Singapore or port of Hong Kong, where they need to plan for the loading and loading of vessels, to the factories of Samsung or TSMC, which needs to dispatch all the different plots and wafers to the different, all these expensive machines. Um, and, the, and we see really two categories, what we call the automated thing. So basically you don't have any users. So this, this a lot of things are, are, have been put in place, but it's like an iceberg, you know, the, the, the really the big thing in the future uh, is really to get all these smart algorithms in the hands of end users. And that, that's really about all about it. So, and that's what Type I has been designed for. And, and I'm seeing um, a big challenge here um, where how do you make, and, and I've seen also some smart data scientists that are also a bit dreaming sometimes about their own algorithm. Like, you know, I've exposed my algorithm, it works perfectly on this data. I finished I finish my job and thinking that it will be whatever the, gen, the algorithm generates will be automatically applied. That's not the case when you deal with end users. They will want to do what if analysis. That's why we have these scenarios. They will want to change parameters to play and decide what, what really um, uh, to do with it. So this is really uh, the big challenge for AI in general is how do you, do you make end users use these algorithms? And this is why we have created TypePy. And uh, that's the biggest challenge, uh, especially now that you know everybody programs in Python. Uh, you have to be successful with this. Uh, and it's not about you know automate what I call automated AI, where you do automatic image recognition, automatic this, automatic that. It's about you know bringing humans to interact with this algorithm, however small they are. And for this, you need intuitive interface. You need to do it easily, quickly, and to connect really uh, with the, 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 the people developing the graphics, the algorithms, and the end users together. So very often, uh, whether you read books, you listen to people, they usually stop at the area of expertise, so it works too much as a silo. So we, we and I think that's the biggest uh, opportunity also for, for the future. Um, so that, that's what we're seeing. AI in a, lot of in a lot of industries, these industries are used in isolation, very often as an automated AI algorithm. And this area where it's used, with end users and for end users, it's just beginning. Nice. Uh, yeah, really exciting times. I think uh, that we're that we're just getting going on this. Um, Vincent, you've been in this industry for a very long time, uh, so it's coming on forty years that you've been working on artificial intelligence, and so no doubt you've seen a lot over those years. Uh, there's been a number of AI winters in those decades. Um, so I would love to hear your perspective of what those were like, you know, to have, you know, that first AI winter in the eighties and ones that have happened since. Um, and then after you've answered that question, I might have you speculate about, uh, what's going to happen in the future. Okay. So. Yes, I'm old enough for that. Uh, it's not quite 40 years yet, 35, I suppose. But yeah, you're <laughs> right. It's 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 really uh, 
when I graduated, it was really, you know, the late 80s. Um, AI was everywhere. Everybody wanted to do AI. It was not as much as now, of course, but, you know, if you could, you would go for an AI degree, and this is what I did. And I loved it. And the first couple of years, well, first two, three years were fantastic. You know, we were doing all these uh, uh, projects and so on. But I realized a lot of the projects failed. Uh, the technology was not there. The data wasn't there. Um, I remember some AI projects uh, that we were involved in. In those days, expert systems were considered AI, for instance. But the data and the rules were changing faster than what we could change. <laughs> so they were, it was doomed from the start. We should probably quickly break that down uh, for our listeners who don't know what expert systems are. So this was the kind of approach to AI where every, every path through the system was hard-coded by a programmer. Yes, it was basically rule, rule programming. You were just defining if then else, and these rules were working in different mode. One was called forward chaining, backward chaining, so basically deducing or inducing. Uh, and this is how it was used. Uh, so that was a big thing uh, in the heydays of AI in the early 90s. And everything stopped after the Japanese, who were really the big promoter of AI in those days. The economy crashed in Japan. But, uh, they have not really recovered since, by the way. And uh, really, a lot of the financing and everything stopped, all of it due to failure, big project failure, small and big. The technology wasn't there. The neural network were really, really slow, uh, not doing much. It was really f toys. At this stage, so that's that's at that time how it happened. Luckily, I was able to work in an, an area of AI which was really kind of protected, uh, not extremely visible. It was really about optimization, planning, scheduling with smart algorithms. You know, basically algorithm ba based on trees, also called uh, you know operation research, mathematical modeling, and this was really performing. We, we saw really large problems. It was still a kind of AI. You were solving problems with smart algorithms behind, based on trees. And that was really a lot of fun. And uh, But that that was dampered somehow by the fact that suddenly everybody had to move into C++ then Java. So you remember also that it's not this AI heydays in the late 80s, early 90s, was not only about AI, there was a flurry of new languages, beautiful languages, like uh, in particular Prolog was a fantastic language. And you have this feeling, like in Python, in fact, it's these are very different languages, but in Python, uh, you, you basically think of something and you move from the ideas to an implementation very quickly. That was the, the capability also uh, you had in Prolog. And all this dis disappeared completely. Uh, very few people were. So everybody moved into mainstream programming in, in C++ and Java. And at that time, I felt really not very exciting in terms of programming languages. It was very boring. In fact, I always hated to, to basically code a lot to, to produce simple results. So it, it was a, coding was very heavy. This has changed completely now. So it's like being reborn. <laughs> nice. Uh, and maybe um, reborn even more that we now today, something that's been really exciting for me and has made data science more exciting than ever has been these large language models that we can plug into and in some cases fine tune. Um, at the time of us recording this episode, GPT-4 has only been out for a week, but there are so many new capabilities that emerge from having access to these foundation models. I've been blown away. I've, over the course of the last week, there have been so many ideas that have come to my mind of new machine learning capabilities, or even just wondering whether I could now automate data labeling for some, you know, previously I, I would have had to have painstakingly myself or, um, or offshored the labeling of data sets that now GPT-4 can do so so competently, like I, I, so I, I often think I'm going to give it something that is just too hard, that's 
too abstract that like I'm even like, am I even am I even explaining this well enough that a human could understand? And it gets exactly what I wanted and gives me the output that I, exactly what I was hoping for. So is this also something, uh, you know, it's I, I hear exactly what you're saying about things like the Python programming language allowing you to move from idea to execution more rapidly than C++ or Java, and that that's really exciting. But yeah, I just, I'm curious if you also have had the same kind of experience that I've had in, in recent weeks. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, so it, at the same time, it's, it's extremely exciting. Um, even the, the, the weird thing about this is that when, even when you program them, if you, if you use this, you can, you can go on hugging face, you can use some of these algorithms and you do transfer learning and you use them for the, your own purpose, like what we do for, with type Python. So that's one of the things we want to automate, to generate automatically some code on the graphical side. Even though you, you understand how it works, um, what they have done and so on, you get surprised. That's, that's really the thing that is, uh, it's rare that you get surprised. Mm -hmm. I've, I've never been surprised that much. Um, it's really the same kind of thing you're saying. You said, maybe I, I haven't done enough. And, and, and you look at it and said, wow, how did he do it? And so th there is this kind of a, of a gap. And it, I can understand also why it can be scary for a lot of people. Um, at the same time, uh, I think we, we have to think of all the use cases that you can get from, from these tools. That's the, the interesting bit. That's the creativity. You know, how can I use the power of this uh, for, uh, well, for my life and when I do programming, when I build a, a library like this? Um, I think we are going to discover a lot of new cases that even the guy who designed this uh, or all the community, in fact, behind it, uh, I've not thought about uh, the start. Um, but uh, for for a company like us, it's it's really we, again, it's not going to make us believe that uh, no code with a this large model language can be automated. I, I don't believe it will happen. But we can really bring it to the right place uh, inside the software to to really uh, make it even more. Uh, more successful, uh, but it's true. I mean, we, we live in a time where uh, it's really unsettling. I would say, uh, exciting and a bit scary sometimes. Yeah, there's certainly. I think it's critical that if you're leading data science projects, or in your case, um, a data centric, a data driven company it's critical that all of us need to be getting used to the kinds of things that GPT-4 can be doing that uh, future foundational models will be able to do. Because if you're not, <laughs> you're probably missing out on commercial opportunities and your competitors are, are probably dabbling and trying to see how they can be. That's, uh, that's exactly what we're seeing amongst the people we meet. The, even before the, the large language models, you, you, you really, already had some kind of acceleration between companies where the gap was, was getting wider between those that were really uh, just thinking about doing something and those that were really well prepared and, and all the way to, to doing extremely sophisticated projects with huge ROI. This will even accelerate this process. So the scary bit is, is that, I mean, if, if you're a CIO these days and if you miss this, it's it's almost like a death sentence. There's no way, it's, it, and it's going to be very hard to catch up. Uh, so there's, there's a whole cut culture change that needs to happen across the whole company, not only the IT, not only the AI or innovation groups. And that's, that's also uh, going to, to create nightmares for CIOs, I, I'm sure. <laughs> and, and, but, Again, you will see, you will see even more uh, blatantly differences between companies. Yeah, nightmares, but also really incredible things that will come out of this, um, uh, out of all of this disruption. So it's clear to me, and I'm sure many of our listeners, from hearing you over the course of this episode, that you're a brilliant person to be working for with an almost unparalleled amount of experience in AI. And 
TyPy, clearly an amazing uh, software library for people to be using, um, open source for uh, data pipelining as well as for user interfaces. So there's probably a lot of listeners out there wondering how they could be working for TyPy and what kinds of opportunities there are. So Vincent, are you doing any hiring and what do you look for in the people that you hire? Okay, so company like us, we're, we are what we call a freemium company. So we have two objectives in life. One is to grow a huge community uh, around TypePy on the open source. Uh, and of course, the other one, which is to get large companies and they often do um, take on the uh, enterprise version of the software, which is mostly about support. Um, the feature-wise, it's basically the same product. So for this, we need people, uh, obviously. So developer advocates for the community, uh, recruiting, basically developers working on our GitHub repository and creating additional things and working with the, the R&D team. We are looking also at evangelists um, that can talk about the product and talk to the community at large. And we are looking also for people for our own R&D. So basically, we have back-end and front-end background. Um, so people who are you know, excited about our graphical interface and people who are really into JavaScript and all will be, this is what we will be looking at, uh, of course, on the back-end, which is more about you know, pipelining. And uh, a lot of this is developed in Python. So it's more a back-end background. Awesome. Uh... Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Are there particular kinds of attributes that uh, make a developer advocate or a backend developer or a front-end developer who applies to TyPy, are there, are there aspects that you look for that you're like, yes, this is somebody that's perfect for a company like ours? So these days, what hasn't changed is that you, don't, you still need to go through an interview and do some technical tests, uh, of course, to check. Um, Surprisingly, yes, experience doesn't seem to be uh, as important as before. Um, and for people with the same number of years, same background, you can see a wide differences uh, in, in capabilities. Because it's all about not only doing your job, but being curious. As people being around looking at you know, all, all the different channels you have to learn is absolutely uh, mind-boggling. And that... That's what creates a difference between candidates. It's not only because you have a good degree or because it's because you're curious. Uh, so curiosity might be the most important uh, quality uh, in there that makes a big difference. Uh, the, the rest, you know, is being able to work with a team uh, um, and to be uh, collaborative, to be, uh, yeah, being co collaborative is more and more important. You know, the sure. days where you have a very smart guy who was, you know, like God and uh, everybody was following him. That I, I lived through that. This doesn't seem to be as successful as before, this kind of of, of model inside an R&D, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. You don't have to deal with huge egos and this kind of thing anymore. Yeah, I think this uh, space, there's just too much to know now for one person to be able to uh, be exactly. that single uh, point in, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, you mentioned curiosity there as one of the key things uh, that makes somebody successful today. For our curious listeners, Vincent, do you have book recommendations? Yes. So again, there are a lot of books, a lot of good books, a lot of bad books. <laughs> um, one book I would, which you were talking about, you know, natural language processing and all this, I would recommend uh, natural language processing with transformers. Uh, from uh, O'Reilly. Uh, this also gives you a good intro to uh, working with Hugging Face. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a, a very nice book and it's fairly recent uh, because now good books are recent books. <laughs> you age very quickly as a book these yeah, days. Yeah. Um, then there are books also on the uh, these are, um, you know patterns. I mean, I like that because of what we're talking about, you know, pipelines and being able to, to create best practices. There are really books uh, like Machine Learning Design pat Patterns, still on O'Reilly, mm -hmm. and Building Machine Learning Pipelines. These are good books. 
uh, for, for those looking at, at building pipelines and so on. And finally, I would recommend one of my favorites. It's really uh, uh, Francois Cholet, uh, any book from him, uh, usually uh, extremely enjoyable. And uh, he has this way of making it easy to explain a difficult concept in deep learning, mm -hmm. uh, of course. And uh, he's the, the guy who, who has been working on Keras. But, yeah. Uh, Definitely uh, one of the rare authors that can explain deep learning well. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so the big book from him, I think, would be the Deep Learning with Python, published by Manning. Yes. The second edition came out in twenty twenty one. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Those are great recommendations, Vincent. And I'm not surprised to get them from you, uh, given how excellent this episode has been. For people who want to continue to learn from you after the episode, how should they follow you? Well, it's easy. So. It's all about our GitHub. So you go to our repo, uh, type by uh, repo, um, do stuff with, with it, uh, and do some, uh, give us some stars if you want. Otherwise, it's all about our LinkedIn uh, page and uh, a lot of stuff on our website also available. Of course, you need to have uh, as much stuff on the in terms of documentation, demos, and things to learn the product. So the website is a really good place. And on Twitter, we are starting to, to be a bit more involved. Nice. All right. Enzo, thank you very much for taking all of this time with us today. Uh, no doubt, as the CEO of Taipei, you have a lot that you need to get done in a given week. So I really appreciate you taking the time with us, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for a great episode. And uh, we look forward to seeing how the Thai Pie environment evolves in the future. Thank you, John. It was a real pleasure discussing with you today. Thanks. What an AI legend to be able to learn from. In today's episode, Vincent filled us in on how the open source TyPy GUI component makes it simple to build front end user interfaces for data driven Python web applications, how the open source TyPy core component makes building pipelines easy through combinations of data nodes for data inputs and outputs, tasks for performing operations on data, and scenarios for executing while allowing for flexible parameter variation. He also talked about how Python is no longer just a glue or ML language, but is increasingly the mainstream choice as application's core language, why TypePy selected Plotly and Visual Studio Code extensions as integral from the start, and how Prolog was a beautiful language designed for AI that, similar to Python today, enables developers to move rapidly from idea to implementation. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Vincent's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 673. That's superdatascience.com slash 673. I encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by tagging me in public posts or comments on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. And if you'd like to engage with me in person as opposed to just through social media, I'd love to meet you in real life at the Open Data Science Conference East. That's ODSC East. It'll be held in Boston from May 9th to 11th. I'll be doing two half-day tutorials. One will introduce deep learning with hands-on demos in PyTorch and TensorFlow, and the other tutorial is brand new. It'll be on fine-tuning, deploying, and commercializing with large language models, including GPT-4. In addition to these two formal events, I'll also just be hanging around, grabbing beers and chatting with folks. It'd be so fun to see you there. All right, thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team, producing another fascinating episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors whom I've hand-selected as partners because I expect their products to be genuinely of interest to you. Please consider supporting this free show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Finally, thanks, of course, to you for listening. It's because you listen that I am here. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.